Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a good hand clap this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for everybody that's able to be here today. We want to reach out to those of you that are joining us online and Thank you for being a part of the service today as well, worshiping the Lord with us wherever you might be. Amen. We're all together in the spirit, and uh, we appreciate you being a part of this service and worshiping the Lord today. Amen. It's really great to see Karen again. God bless you. Great lady of God, and uh, it's great to have her back. I know she's got a lot of responsibilities there with her mom and family, and, of course, that's what we do. We take care of family, right? But God bless her. She's part of this family as well, so we miss you when you're not here. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good, and happy uh, Labor Day to everybody. I hope you all are going to get some time to spend with your families and enjoy a little time off. Take a break from all the craziness that's going on around us, amen, and just focus on people we love and our, and our God, amen. Yes. Amen. It's going to be a good one, praise the Lord. You know, uh, masks have no face value. We're all getting used to that, aren't we? A little bit, anyway. If we're going anywhere, you got to have one. So, and I just think of two Labor Day. You know, that's great. Uh, but you know, obstetricians celebrate Labor Day every day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay. Well, you know, we kind of live out in the kind of out in the country, and uh, there's other houses around us, but we're kind of away from everything else. And uh, I saw a magic tractor yesterday. Seriously, it turned into a field. <laughs> right before my very eyes. I only do this in hopes that the message will then seem much better. Yes. These are so horrible, praise the Lord. Amen. You know, a lot of people now are trying to work out in the, you know, the gyms and the spas and all that stuff. Well, I don't go to the gym. I call that resistance training. <laughs> praise the Lord. Okay, praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Uh, again, happy Labor Day. Appreciate you all that uh, still getting after it. Amen. Working and doing the things that keep this country going and keep all of us up and fed and clothed and all those things that we do. And It's a blessing, praise the Lord. So God gave us uh, the strength to be able to do it so that he could bless us through those things, and uh, we appreciate that so much. Praise the Lord. Now, I'm, I'm grateful for the... Uh, the testimonies and the sharing uh, what God's doing in each of your lives and how he's speaking to you. And it does speak uh, to what I want to share with you this morning. As always, Tim nails it when it comes to the spirit. I'm just, we're, we're blessed to have him. I'm telling you that, Tim. I appreciate you so much. And um, it never fails. I mean, week after week, God just witnesses through the words that he's speaking into our hearts. And we all kind of pick up on the same vibe and we know that we're one spirit, right? Yeah. Praise the Lord. And that's great. So let's go to Matthew chapter 12, and I want to read uh, verses 33 through 37. Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Now we're talking about the Word of God and how we are to speak, how we are to control our tongue. And uh, I know it, it can become almost like it's a fad or it's, a, it's the latest kind of religious deal that somebody came up with, you know, confess the Word, and whatever it might be. The truth is, it is the Word of God. It isn't just some gimmick. It isn't just some uh, late coming uh, thing to try or to do. It is what the Word of God says. And that's what I want to reveal to you this morning, what God has been showing me in Jesus' name. So in Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, he says, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Praise the Lord. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Praise the Lord. That's your words. That's what you say. Praise the Lord. Now, 
every person has seven openings in their head. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. And uh, by the way, that's the same number that denotes completion in the scripture. So we've got three pairs of openings, right? Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, but one mouth. And that one opening causes us more problems than the other six all put together. Or at least it does me, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, you just sometimes we speak without thinking or we just respond to, to a situation or a circumstance. I mean, Karen was talking about it. Her natural yeah. senses are saying, you need, to, you need to say something. I mean, you need to put a stop to it, right? And so a lot of times we'll get caught up in the emotion or our concern for somebody else and then say things that right. maybe not be the best thing to say, right? And so it happens. It happens to me. It happens in our relationship, my relationship with Sally sometimes, you know. Um, you know what the scripture says to speak slowly. Yes. You know, take time to hear. You know, hear quick. Be quick to hear, but slow. slow to speak. And a lot of times we're just the opposite. We're a little slow on the intake and really quick on the output, you know, and just try to mess things up that way. Amen? So this, if you take a concordance, and, and I've done this, and you go and look up the words related to that one opening right here, amen, the mouth, you get the mouth, the tongue, lips, speech, words, and it just goes on and on, but they're all relative to the same thing, amen. And you'll be amazed how much the Bible has to say about this, just this one subject. Now, if the Bible takes all that time and, and inference and, and uh, impetus, Kind of to get us moving in that direction, to make it about this, then we ought to take the time to check it out and see what it is God's really trying to say to yes. us, right? And so there's no area in our life, in fact, there's no area in our personalities that are more directly related to our total well-being, amen, than the mouth and the tongue. Let, let's, uh, this, uh, I just was looking at this when we were uh, in the preliminaries here, and I, I come up with this one scripture. I just want us to share this. I really didn't have it in my notes initially, but 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. You know, Jesus went about doing miracles everywhere he went. And he said that uh, he never said anything but what he heard his father say. And he never did anything but what he saw his father do. So he says, he that saith he abideth in him, in Jesus, himself also uh, Ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Right? How did he walk? Well, he only said what his father said. Yeah. He only did what his father did, what he saw his father do, right? He said, he abideth in him, ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Praise the Lord. Which means then that we should have a, we should set a watch on our tongue, as the scripture says. In other words, we need to be mindful of the things that we say impact everything around us our lives most especially, but other people's as well, right? Yes. And so Psalms 34, verse 11 through 13. Psalms 34, 11, excuse me, 11 through 13. Come ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. So the definition of the fear of the Lord, it used to, this used to really scare me when I was younger, uh, before I really understood the scripture, because I'm thinking, man, I, I know I'm afraid of the Lord. If he ever catches up with me, you know, in my behavior or whatever, I'm going to be in big trouble. But that isn't what it's talking about here. That fear of the Lord, the definition of fear of the Lord is respect, confidence in, or faith in God's goodness. Amen? That's what the fear of the Lord really is. It's not being afraid. It's being awed by his faithfulness to us, and his truth and his word. Amen? And, and uh, faith in him is how we show our fear of the Lord or our respect for the Lord, right? So uh, when the scripture offers to teach us the fear of the Lord, as it does here, then it's offering something that has tremendous value or it wouldn't be here in the first place, Right? So by implication, the psalmist said that life and many good days go with the fear of the Lord. They go hand in hand, right? So life and long days or long life, life and good days 
are part and parcel of the fear of the Lord. Amen. In the Bible, life in its fullness and the fear of the Lord are always associated together. Amen. So the measure of our fear of the Lord is the same measure by which we enjoy true life. Okay, so again, the fear of the Lord is respect for God, confidence in Him, amen, faith in His goodness and His uh, faithfulness to His Word, amen. And so the measure of our fear of the Lord or our respect for the Lord or our faith in God is the same measure by which we enjoy true life. The more we have that for God, the more our life is going to be blessed, the more we're going to enjoy it, the more we're going to experience everything God really wants for us in life, right? So practically speaking, where does the fear of the Lord begin? Where, do, where does it start, right? And again, the psalmist tells us, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Now, we have thought maybe, you know, growing up or whatever in church, we thought keep your tongue from evil meant, you know, don't cuss somebody out. Well, that's probably a good idea, too, but that's not necessarily what he's talking about here. Or your lips from speaking lies, you know, like, well, I did my homework, but the dog ate it, you know, one of those kind of things. That's not what he's talking about either. He's talking about anything that is in disagreement with what, what God has said is a lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. So if we're not saying what God says, if we're saying something that contradicts what God says, we're lying. Yes. And we're speaking evil. Right? And so, uh, in other words, the first area of our lives where the fear of the Lord is going to be practically manifested, where you're really actually going to see it, is our tongue and our lips. If we're saying what God says. That's the first place where it's revealed. Now, if you're saying things that are contrary to that, if you're, like Tim was talking about this morning, if you're always freaking out about the, the situation or the circumstance, instead of standing on what God has said, that tells us something about where you are spiritually, right? And I'm not being critical or judgmental. I'm just saying that's how we can evaluate where we are, because we all have these things, you know, I mean, we all speak out of turn, as they say sometimes. In other words, just in the hot, in the moment, the heat of the moment, or in the uh, situation or the circumstance, or even maybe fear is coming, we'll be quick to say something about that rather than keeping quiet until we can say exactly what God said about it. Amen? So uh, if we can keep our tongues from evil and we can keep our lips from speaking lies, we can move into the fullness of the fear of the Lord, into the depth of the relationship that God has asked us to be a part of. Amen? Out of the fear of the Lord comes life and many good days. Praise the Lord. The fear of the Lord, life, good days, and the proper use or control of your tongue and our lips, they're all bound together. They're all part and parcel of the same thing. Amen? We can't really have good lives if we don't control our tongue and our lips. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 13.3. I hope we'll take this serious because, I look, I've been dealing with this for a number of years. Uh, when God really began to open it up to me and, and show it to me. And I, I'm telling you, it drives me crazy when I'm around people that it just open their mouth and start talking about negative stuff without even thinking. And I'm not saying they're horrible people. I'm just saying they're letting their circumstance and the situation dictate what's real to them. And when you start saying it, it becomes real even if it wasn't real before. Praise the Lord. So, I, I mean, I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is that we speak in agreement with God's Word. No matter what. If you can't say what God's saying, don't say anything. Wait. Slow down. Praise the Lord. Because you're going to get what you're saying. I'm just I'm telling you, that's what the Word of God tells us over and over and over. And you can think that, well, it's just a, it's a gimmick. It's a, no, it's the Word of God. It's how God has told us that we are to operate. And if we don't operate by His uh, means of, of operating, we're in rebellion. We're, we're operating against God. We're contradicting what God's trying to do in our lives. And then we wonder why chaos. You know, why is it so messed up, right? So he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. But he that open wide his lips shall have destruction. Now I'll tell you what, I've got a few bruises and some old wounds just because of that. Yes, yes. Amen? Because not knowing when to keep my mouth shut, yes. got it shut for me a few times over the years. Amen? And so even natural life will teach you some things. Sometimes you ought to know when to keep quiet, right? Sometimes you ought to know when to stand up and speak and when you ought to just wait and let's see how things settle out here. Praise the Lord. But that's what he's saying here in Proverbs 3. He who guards his lips 
guards his soul. The soul is your emotions, your, your mental makeup, you know, the way you think and, and act, so forth. Amen. And so that he who speaks rashly will come to ruin. That's the NIV translation. Amen. Your soul is your whole personality. Right? That's who you are. Amen. And so I'm, I'm not talking about spiritually speaking here, but your soul is what your human personality is all about. It, it reflects who you are, how you think, right? So it's the area where weaknesses, because of that, is the area where weaknesses manifest first. Praise the Lord. It's where the enemy will gain access the quickest. Is into your mind, into your thoughts, into your, right? Into your soul. Praise the Lord. So if you want to guard your soul, you've got to guard your yes, mouth. You've got to yes. guard your lips. Praise the Lord. But if you speak rashly, you come to ruin. Bad stuff's going to happen. That's what he tells us. Amen. See, we have authority. And that authority works both ways. You speak negative, you're going to get results that way just the same as you would if you speak positive. Because you have authority. God has given you that authority here on earth. And that's why we have to have the good sense to use that authority in agreement with God's word if we want those kind of results. Amen. These promises don't just happen by osmosis. They don't just happen. They don't just fall on us. How many of you know that? We've, how long you live for God, right? And the, and the blessings of God don't necessarily just come to you because you believe in God. That's right. I mean, if that's what it is, then the only benefit we have of believing in God, which is a great one, you're going to go to heaven. Yes. But life here can still be held for however number of years you're here, unless you learn to use that authority the way God intended it to be used. Amen? So the alternatives are clear. If you control the tongue, then you've got protection. But if your tongue gets out of control, you don't master your words, in other words, then the end is, is destruction. It's ruin. It's a mess. Amen? See, the, it's clear. There's nothing, there's nothing vague about this. God makes it absolutely clear. This is it. This is how it has to be done. Look, Proverbs 21, verse 23. Who keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Everybody here, somebody say, you know, he's got such a big mouth. Well, there's something I could say here right now. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. Your rear end ought to be jealous of your mouth because of all the crap that's coming out of it. Have you ever? I know that's a horrible thing, but it's, but right? I mean, it's just. I've thought that a few times. I've wanted to say it, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm just sharing it with my friends, okay? I can, I can do that, but praise the Lord. But if you guard your mouth and you guard your tongue, then you guard your soul. Yes. Amen? Yes. And your life is safe. Praise the Lord. But if you don't, the alternative is chaos, yes. calamity, bad stuff, right? Proverbs uh, 15 and verse 4. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. Now, that's a powerful statement. The wholesome tongue is a tree of life, or the tongue that speaks truth, it's a tree of life. It, it grows. You know, it's a positive, right? But the perverseness or the wrong use of the tongue is a leak in the spirit or a breach in the spirit, right? So he's telling us where well, the King James Version says uh, a wholesome tongue, the literal Hebrew says the healing of the tongue. Yes. So that makes it clear. Our tongue can need healing. Praise the Lord. And the healing of the tongue is a tree of life. Amen. And notice again, this close connection between life and the correct use of your tongue. Now, God's given this to us for a reason. It isn't just for random reading for the heck of it sometime when you're bored. It's to help us to understand how to live our lives with the authority that God's given us and get the outcome, the promises of God to manifest in our lives and in the lives of the people that we are praying for and, and living with, you know? Amen. So notice again, this is the connection here. And the alternative is if you're not speaking 
the, using the correct use of the tongue, right, the alternative is perverseness. And the result of a perverseness or the wrong use of your tongue is a breach in the spirit. Amen? So perverseness means wrong use. It means to use it the wrong way. Amen? So get this. The misuse of the tongue is a breach or a leak in your spirit. Amen? And you can get a blessing, right? I've seen this happen multiple times yeah. over my yeah. life as a Christian, right? And I'm sure we all have, even with ourselves sometimes. But you can get a blessing, a healing, a deliverance, amen? But it can leak out or it can run out through your mouth. Because symptoms may come back, right? Or this issue may come or some other thing come to cause you to focus on that and start speaking in agreement with that rather than in agreement with what God has yes. promised, your yes. healing, your deliverance, your, your yes. breakthrough, whatever it might be, amen? So if you're going to be a container of the blessings of the Lord, amen, it's one thing to be blessed, right? But he said he has blessed us to be a blessing, like, like with right. Father Abraham, right? And so it's one thing to be blessed, but it's another thing to contain the blessing. Right? Not to just momentary. I mean, we've experienced this. You come to church, and you get a blessing, and you go out the door, and it's like all hell breaks loose. Yes. You know, hardly get to the parking lot, and, you know, the crap's going on already, right? So we get a blessing, but can we contain the blessing? Yes. Can we keep it from leaking out? Can we keep it from breaching, amen, our spirit? So it's the, the, the healing of the tongue is a tree of life that brings life to us, but not just to us. See, if I'm a container, then I can share it. I can lay hands on the sick. I can speak positive yes. into people's lives, right? But if I'm leaking out, yes. I'm so busy trying to keep me, that amen, that I can't do anything. For, I can't be a blessing to anybody else. I can't really help anyone else. Praise the Lord. And so a tree of life, and that brings life to me, but not just to me, but to other people. It works inwardly, and it works outwardly. That's how the Word of God works. Praise the Lord. Amen. Proverbs 18 and verse 21. And this thing is, it, this isn't really hard. It's just that we have a tendency to always fall back to, the, to, to what's comfortable for us. Yes. And that is mm -hmm. anger, right? Yes. Retaliation, frustration, whatever it might be. And so when we're not thinking, when we're not keeping this uppermost in our mind, it leaks. We are leaky vessels. Amen? Praise the Lord. And, and God, you know, he wants us to be vessels of honor. Vessels that truly represent him. And that doesn't mean that we never fail or that we never make a mistake. It just means that we always speak in agreement with his word, even if we're a little deviated from that truth. Amen. Even if we have drifted a little bit one way or the other, yes. we need to keep our mouth yes. in line with what God's word says in order to get what that word says. Praise the Lord. So death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now that's, I mean, come on. It doesn't get much more powerful than that, does it? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. They that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Yes. Eat the fruit of what? Of either one. Whichever one it is you're speaking. Yeah. Right? So the NAS says death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. So the alternatives are always clear. It's either death or it's life. It's either positive or it's negative. Amen? They're both in the power of the tongue. Amen? If we use our tongues properly... They're going to be trees of life. They'll produce good fruit, right? But if we use our tongue perversely or in the wrong way, the result is death. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily just physical, although that, that's part of it, but it means either life to God's word, it comes alive to us, or it's dead. It doesn't produce. It doesn't produce what it's supposed to produce, right? And so whichever way we use our tongue, you can be sure you're going to eat the fruit of that. Whether it's good or whether it's evil, whether it's life or whether it's death. If the fruit is sweet, we're going to eat sweet fruit, right? If the fruit is bitter, and we've all had to eat a little of that bitter from time to time, right? Then that's what happens. That's what we end up with. See, the state of your tongue is the sure indication of your spiritual condition. So if you're struggling with, you know, where am I with God? Just think about the things that you're saying. Now, that has nothing to do with how much God loves you. But it does have to do with how much God can do for you because he has given us authority. Right? God's already said everything he needs to say. Right? And it's now it's a question of what are we going to say? 
Are we going to say what we hear our fathers say? Yes. Or are we going to hear what Fox News says or CNN or MSNBC or somebody else, right? I mean, are we, are we going to agree with the circumstance or are we going to speak like God to the circumstance yes. so that it can change? God saw chaos uh, over this world, right? Yes. And he spoke. But what did he speak? He spoke light. He spoke yes. revelation. He spoke goodness. He spoke yes. unity and, 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 and love and so on and so forth. That's where we have to be. Because I'm telling you, and you know this as well as I do, just, just living in this day is depressing. Yes. And if you let it eat on you, it, right. it'll get to you where you start acting out of that, not even knowing why. Just, you're in a funk, right? I mean, all you're hearing is the, the negative and the, what bad thing and how many died and who, how many more do they think will and how long is it going to go on and will they ever have a cure and blah, 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 blah. And you get to the place where you just want to... Curl up. It reminds me of the scripture where it talks about in those last days when people would run to the caves and ask them to just to fall in on them. Right? I'm just tired of dealing with it. I don't want to go through this anymore. You know, all that kind of stuff. And that's basically where we're at. So the state of our tongue indicates where we are in our relationship, where we are spiritually speaking. Amen? So let's go back to where we began here at Matthew 12, 33 through 37 again, just to pick up on that idea of the trees and the fruit. Amen? Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O oh, generation of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? Now, the thing this reminds me of, too, is Jesus said, I'm the vine, or I'm the tree, you're the branches. Well, if we're not abiding, if, if, if we say we're abiding in Jesus, but we're talking in contradiction to what yeah. Jesus says, then we're really not abiding in him. Yeah. Now, we can be saved but we're not abiding in him. And so if we're not abiding in him, the fruit that we bear is not going to be coming from the tree, right? It's going to be negative fruit. It's not going to be the positive fruit that Jesus uh, wants us to experience. So a generation of vipers, how can you be evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man... Out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. I mean, it goes all the way back to the garden. That's what Satan was trying to do, was get them to say something different than what God had said. It's planting doubts, planting questions in their minds so that they would speak out or speak perversely rather than in agreement with God. Amen? And so Jesus makes a, a direct connection here between the heart and the mouth. And he uses this parabolic language or the language of, of, of parables. Amen? And he refers to the heart as the tree and the words that come out of the mouth as the fruit. So here's the, here's the tree right here. And whatever's coming out of it is the fruit. Right? So the kind of words that come out of our mouth indicate the condition of our heart. For example, he said, the good man out of his good treasure in his heart brings forth good words yes. and the evil man out of the evil treasure in his heart brings forth evil words. Wow. Amen? So Jesus used the word good three times and he used the word evil three times. So they have the same kind of power, yes. the same kind of impact, the same kind of influence, or not the same kind, but the same uh, quantity, I should say. Amen? So, Matthew 7, 17 and 18. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So, when he talks about being disciples, a disciple is someone who is disciplined in a way of living. And this is what he's talking about. It isn't about that we never, you know, lose our temper, or that we never say a bad word, or that we never do anything that might be considered uh, negative or unproductive. But it's that when we speak, we'll speak in agreement with God even when I'm failing. Even when I'm yes, screwing up, yes. I'm going to say I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Even when I'm not doing perfect, I'm going to say I am the beloved of the Lord. He yes. is my father. Amen. Yes. Right? Yes. He, I, I'm the prodigal. He runs yes. to me. Praise the Lord. So we have to keep our minds in agreement with God's word so that the words that come out of our mouth will be in agreement with his word. Right? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Praise the Lord. So when we're in ourselves, that's the corrupt tree. When we're in Jesus, right, we're, we're in the good fruit. We're in the good tree, right? 
And when we deviate from that, or leave the Word of God, we're now on our own, and we are evil in and of ourselves, just because separation from God. I'm not talking about, he, didn't he say, you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children? He wasn't saying they're, they're Satan or they're the devil. They're just saying they're not, you, even you people that aren't saved know how to bless your children, know how to give good things to your kids, know how to, you know, right, interact with them. So how much more does your Heavenly Father want to give you the Holy Spirit, right, or the Spirit of God, right? Yes. So here he says, Jesus used that word so many times, but the tree is the heart and the fruit is the mouth. Praise the Lord. So let's look at uh, the, here's two prophetic pictures uh, from the Old Testament. And it says, uh, the first is Jesus himself, the Messiah. And the second is the bride of Christ. Now, what I want you to see is in each case, the Father is speaking to us, to the Spirit, amen. And the feature that's emphasized first and foremost is the condition of the lips and the mouth, right? So there's two prophetic pictures. They're all through the Bible, but I'm looking at two specific ones. And the first one is Jesus himself, and the second one is us, his bride, or the church, right? So look at this in Psalms 45, verses 1 and 2. So my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Now David, the psalmist here, is writing prophetically about Jesus, about the Messiah. And he says, my heart is indicting a good matter. I speak of the things which I have made touching the king. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. Thou art fairer than the children of men. Grace is poured into thy lips. Therefore God hath blessed thee forever. Praise the Lord. So it's a picture of Jesus, the Messiah, in his grace. Amen. His beauty. His moral purity. Amen. And what's the first aspect of that beauty that's manifested, the first thing that can be seen in him? His lips. Christ, it, the Bible says grace, it says, is poured upon his lips. Amen. And then, therefore, God has blessed him forever. Amen. Grace was poured on his lips. So he only says what God says. Right? He only, he only speaks the same in agreement with God, and that's why he says grace is poured on his lips. Amen. And he is blessed forever. Yes. Praise the Lord. Look at this in John chapter 7, verse 45 and 46. And you can see where this comes into play in the New Covenant. Now, this is still under the Old Testament, but it's speaking to the New Covenant. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? They said, Go get that guy and bring him in here. He's creating all kinds of havoc for us religious people. He's, he's making a mess of, of Judaism. So go get him and bring him to me. Well, they didn't. And when they came back, he said, Why didn't you bring him? I, I sent you out there to get him. And when they, the officers answered, We never heard anybody talk like this guy. <laughs> he, it was so powerful that they forgot what they were there for. They couldn't even do the one thing that they were sent to do, which was to arrest him, because his words had such power, yes. such truth, such beauty, that they were stunned. They were just shocked. They didn't know what to do about it. They thought, I'm not arresting this guy. I never heard anybody talk like this before. And what, how did Jesus talk? He only said what his father said. And that's what stunned them. That's what caused them to be in awe. Never heard anybody talk. I wonder how much the world would respond that same way to us if we kept our focus on where it's supposed to be, right? If we just said what God says, what kind of an impact it could have on the people that we interact with. Amen? Amen. The grace that poured from his lips marked him as the Messiah. It identified him with God. And these people knew it, even though they didn't understand the whole theology of it. They understood there's something very godlike in this person. We've never heard anybody. We've heard all the rabbis. We've heard all the priests. We've heard all the religious people. And we've never heard anybody talk like this guy. Amen. So now look at this in the Song of Solomon. There's a prophetic picture of Jesus and his bride and the relationship between them. So in Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 4, verse 3. And this is all Suzanne's fault because... 
20 years ago, she gave me a CD a collection of, uh, or not CDs, but that was back when they were still uh, cassette tapes uh, on the Song of Solomon and the interaction. I really didn't want to listen to it. I thought that's kind of that lovey-dovey stuff, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense. And you know, her lips are this, and her love, you know, and I'm gonna you know, like really, I'm just not that kind of a romantic person, you know. So it's a little difficult to handle. But the more I got into it, the more I realized how it was God talking to us, you know. But so thy lips are like a thread of scarlet. Thy speech is comely. Thy temples are like a piece of a pomegranate within thy locks. Praise the Lord. Now, in the new uh, international version, it reads like this. And that's addressed to the bride, right? And he says it this way. Your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Praise the Lord. And so here he goes on to say then, first, first thing that's mentioned here is the bride's lips. Remember, we're the bride. We are the bride of Christ. Amen. So the first thing that's mentioned about his church or his bride are the lips. And that word scarlet indicates sanctification. The lips of the bride are sanctified, right? Through the blood of Jesus. They're red. Amen. The lips have been touched by the blood of Christ. And the result, the mouth is lovely. Praise the Lord. Now the face is hidden behind a veil, it says. And still the voice is heard through the veil. Amen? Other, the other beauties, the other aspects or physicalness of that thing is covered. It's a veil. You can't see. You can't really see behind it, so you can't really identify it. But the beauty of the voice comes out through the veil. Now let me just ask you if you don't know what this might be. It's a veil. It's not us. It's just the vehicle. It's just the transportation. And it actually veils our true identity, which is in Christ. Right? Our spirit that was born again when we trusted in Jesus. Yes. So it's, you can't really see, right? But you can hear Jesus. You can't really see the perfection of the spirit. You can't really see the beauty of the spirit. But you can still hear it. You can still yes. receive it through the words. Right? We're all flawed. Let's face it. We know that. We, we know none of us are perfect. And we all look different. But only here. Only this thing. There's only one parent. I, or one pair of parents, I should say. Adam and Eve. I just read this the day before yesterday. And I'm not trying to get into a racial thing here. I'm just saying this is for all of us. Period. 99.9% yes, yes. .9 of every one of us have exactly the same DNA. Same genetic makeup. There's no difference. One tenth of one percent is what separates us. And that could be anything. Yeah. Amen? I mean, it could be your Dutch. It could be your yeah. French. It could be your Japanese. It could be your African. It doesn't matter. Yeah. It's one little tenth of one percent. And the 99.9% .9 of us are identical. Yeah. Identical. Yeah. And inside... It's 100% identical because we all have the same spirit. There is no difference. That's what God says. That's how he sees us. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the, the voice is what's most manifested. In other words, it's the most important. It's what God puts value on. What we say. Because it has such a powerful impact, not only on ourselves, how we see ourselves, how we speak of ourselves, but how then we will speak to others. You know, if you're really ticked off, it's hard to be kind to somebody else when you're in the middle of an anger, frustrated, whatever it is, right? I mean, it's just hard to be gentle and loving, right? Even though you have the capacity to do it, we're caught up in the moment of this anger or frustration or whatever it might be. Right. And it stops us from speaking the beauty of God. Yeah. And what it does is it, it lifts the veil and shuts our mouth. Mm -hmm. right. it, it shows our physical person, but it stops the spirit from being able to influence anyone around you, including yourself. 
Because the words that you speak have the greatest impact on you. Yes. You know, that's why we talk about confessing the word, speaking it out loud. Why? Because what you hear, when you hear your own voice, it has the greatest impact on you than any other voice possible. Yeah. Right? I mean, it just does. And then you hear your voice on a recording, and you think, who is that? Because <laughs> it doesn't sound like the voice that's inside you. Yeah. You know, when, you, when we're speaking like this, I hear myself, but I'm hearing from the inside out. Right. When I hear it on a tape, I'm hearing it from the outside in, and it sounds like, I don't know who that clown is. <laughs> he sounds like an idiot. <laughs> right? But when I'm talking, oh, that's pretty good. That's good voice. You know, that's yes. not a bad sounding voice, right? <laughs> I hear it coming back, and I sound like Elmer Pyle or somebody, and I wonder, what the heck happened? you got to get Mike to work on that recorder. It's distorting me. But you know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is our own voice has the greatest impact on us. So when we speak out loud, when we read the Word of God, read it out loud a lot of times. It's good to just speak it out, amen, because it has a, a, a positive impact on our hearing, amen, and our receiving that, all right? So the voice is the thing that's most manifested here. Now, let's look at this. Let me show you something else here. In Song of Solomon, uh, verse 411, I thought, uh, this just amazed me when I first saw it. This is Song of Solomon, chapter 4, and verse 11. And he says, Thy lips, O my spouse, again is the Lord speaking to the bride or to the church. Your lips, O my spouse, drop as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under thy tongue, and the smell of thy garments is like the smell of Lebanon. Wow. So the tongue of the bride, or the tongue of the church, is honey and milk. That also happens to be the two features of the promised land. Oh, yeah. Our place of rest, our place that God draws us to and calls us to so that we can get the promises. Yes. All the promises he gave to Israel, they, all they had to do was go there and get them, right? Yes. They were waiting for them. And so he's talking to us the same way. And he says, so I'm going to close. I've I, I got maybe one more scripture here, but I'm closing. The beauty of the promised land is seen in us. All of the promises of God are revealed through us. Amen? And especially in our tongue, in the way that we speak. In our lips that penetrate the veil, that break through the physical human form. Even though the bride is not clearly seen behind the veil, but her voice and her aroma, her fragrance. Doesn't Jesus talks about in another place uh, the, the aroma of the believers, of the called out ones. Yes. A, a beautiful aroma, he says it is. And so the, even though you can't see it, the voice and the aroma of the bride can be identified. Amen. But her voice and her fragrance penetrate the veil of the beauty of her lips. Numbers uh, 14, 6 through 9, and this is, this is where I'll wrap up here. Numbers 14, verses 6 through 9. Just to stay in the context of where we're at right this moment with the church. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. Now, they'd heard the words of the Israelites, right? They went out and searched the land. They come back, and 10 of those 12 had a perverse word, a distorted word, a word that wasn't in agreement with God, right? There's giants over there. We can't do it. We can't go. We can't go. They were all just totally carnal, totally basing everything that come out of their mouth on what they had seen, except for Joshua and Caleb. And it says, Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, which were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes when they heard this. They got, oh, my God. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search, it is an exceeding good land, as God had told them. If the Lord delight in us, then he'll bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So here, I'm, I will just close with this. Words will get you into the promised land. They'll get you into the promises of God. Or words will keep you out of the promised land and keep you from ever experiencing the promises of God. They are life and they are death in your tongue. A land of milk and honey, life. Or a land in the wilderness and death. 
something simple. Praise the Lord. Everything under that old covenant was a picture of Jesus and the bride. Their failings are the things that keep us from failing. If we'll use our good sense and the word of God and speak to the words that God has spoken. And we can live in houses we didn't build. Amen. We can, we can eat from the vineyards that we didn't plant. Praise the Lord. We can experience the promises of God and the rest of God to where we just trust and declare what God has said and we receive the benefits of all of that. Just as Jesus did. He went about doing good everywhere he went. How did he do it? By only saying what his father said. By only doing what he saw his father do. And we are all capable of that. Don't let the veil freak you out. Amen? You've got such power that your words penetrate that veil. Your words penetrate this flesh. Your words go past what we are physically and declare us to be the bride of Christ. Declare us to be his offspring. Amen? Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Set a watch on my tongue, Lord. So I want to say what you say so that I can get everything that you've promised me to have. Amen? Yes. Glory to God. We can have it. We can do it. Praise the Lord. Or he yes. wouldn't have asked us to. Yes. Amen. He has empowered us. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. To enter into that promised land. Yes. To be the milk and honey. Hallelujah. Amen. Yes. Love you all. God bless you. Have a great week. Yes. Enjoy your Labor Day off, hopefully. And be with family and friends. And just have a good day. Relax. And enjoy the blessings of the Lord. Amen. Yes. You are dismissed in his mighty name.